We begin this morning with the ruling All Progressive Congress begging of cost of its presidential form at 100 million naira. Female aspirants will get free nomination forms and will have to pay for the expression of interest forms. Arise correspondent Undi Amago was at the party's National Executive Committee meeting where it opted for indirect primary elections in choosing its presidential candidates for the 2023 elections. At this 11th National Executive Committee meeting of the All Progressives Congress, and the first under the chairmanship of the Senator Abdullahi Adamu-led National Working Committee of the party, critical decisions on the cost of nomination forms, mode of party primaries, and the devolution of powers of the NEC to the NWC for a period of 90 days are at the top of the agenda. President Muhammad Buhari, Vice President Yemi Oshibajo, President of the Senate, Ahmad Lawan, Speaker of the House of Representatives, Fabi Wajabia Mila, along with the Chairman of the Progressive Governors Forum, Abubakar Bagudu, and others are all in attendance. The National Chairman, in his remarks, is asking for more unity and party discipline among APC members ahead of the 2023 general elections. As we see it, this body has two critical parts to it. The first part is the full and complete unity of the party. The second is winning the 2023 general elections. How we handle the first will determine how we achieve the second. Chairman of the Governor's Forum, Abubakar Bagudu, while commending the APC-led federal government, says when most states could not meet up with their financial obligations, President Muhammad Buhari approved bailout funds which rescued them, and that the idea was a novelty by the government. And it was due process that led us to the very, very successful convention that has shamed our critics. The leadership of the National Assembly also had a few words of admonition for the party's members and leadership on the need to promote the achievements of the APC in the midst of allegations of underperformance by the Buhari administration. The nine members of the National Assembly of APC stop have been persistent. We have shown complete loyalty to our party. We remain committed to the end. The President, Muhammad Buhari, while thanking all the aspirants that withdrew in deference to his call and for the party's unity during the national convention, is urging them to work assiduously for the APC's success during the general elections. I call on all party members to abide by all extant laws, rules, and regulations, and to, lead, and, and to leaders of our party to avoid imposition of candidates that cannot win popular elections. After the NEC meeting, APC spokesperson Felix Morka provided more insight on the discussions reached by the party's second highest decision-making organ, including the cost of nomination forms. Resolution. Essentially, has devolved, devolved the powers of NEC. The NEC meeting was summoned by the APC as part of measures to ensure compliance with Section 84 of the Electoral Act based on the electoral calendar released by the INEC. Political parties have until June 3 to submit the list of their flag bearers for the presidential, governorship, national and state legislative seats. The electoral body says failure to comply or deny any political party representation. Ndi Amogo, Arise News. 
All right, a lot to unpack this morning, Tundu. And we do have to keep it brief. Mm. So I'll just talk about what is really raising a lot of eyebrows, the prohibitively expensive expression of interest and nomination forms mm. at 100 million naira. And um, we're going to be discussing this with our guest later on this morning, the APC um, National Women's Leader. But for me, what it brings to the fore is how do parties finance their activities? Because you know, that party, that structure does need to be financed. It needs money to run itself. And yesterday's debate between President Macron and Marine Le Pen and about her national rally party's loan from a Russian bank was used to devastating effect by her opponent. The fact is that she went to a Russian bank in 2014 and secured a loan of 9.4 euros that she has not been able to pay. So that, I'm linking the two stories together. I imagine what APC is trying to do is raise money in a clean, above-board manner so that they're not beholden to outside interests, certainly not foreign interests, as we're seeing in France what Marine Le Pen has been accused of, being a Kremlin ally, being a Kremlin stooge. They gave you this money. What do they expect for the money? So that might be what they're trying to achieve. But it does seem som somewhat, you know, out of touch with the nation's current economic travails. People are really having problems making ends meet. And there we are, our ruling party, requesting 100 million Naira in um, nomination forms and expression of interest forms. And we all know that those who are going to vie for this um, presidential election must be able to provide it. Yeah. And it just seems like such a slap in the face. Cash and carry politics, all these things come up. Look at the Electoral Act as well that was amended. The presidential campaign has now been reviewed upwards. Mm -hmm. You are now allowed a ceiling of five billion Billion naira, upwards from one billion naira. So it just it's it's not a very good sign for mm -hmm. democracy. I mean, for me, political parties will get money either way. That money is just too much. In a country where 96 or 97 percent of the population do not even have close to 200 or 500 thousand naira in their bank accounts, it is too much. And I'll dial back. I said something yesterday to a group of people. I said, see. We started holding general elections in this country in 1923. And that was the first legislative council election, the one that was held in Lagos and in Calabar. Many things were around the that. Clifford the, the Clifford Constitution of 1922. 22. All right. Many things were centered around that election. You had to have earned 100 pounds in the last calendar year before you were eligible to vote. A lot of people were caught up because of the money barrier. Out of the 99,000 population in Lagos, only 4,000 people were eligible to vote. Also, the nomination form was pegged at 10 pounds, which raised a big brouhaha, because most people didn't have 10 pounds for nomination form, and people wanted to participate. So different unions had to come through for people. And when you look at that election, a lot of people said it was given to the rich, as quoted by Tamuno in his book. 100 years after, Nigeria is still in that place today. With this 100 million mark, what you're saying invariably is like, a young Nigerian that's passionate about the country, if he doesn't have 100 million. And I hope in the spirit of this, all the people that are putting that 100 million down, they should also put down their tax returns. Because if you can put 100 million to buy a nomination form that you might still be screened out, that is not an open sesame that you will win the primaries, then it's only best that we can see how much tax return you have. Okay, one of the major concerns in Nigerian politics has been the monetization of the political process. And ahead of the 2023 general elections, what we're seeing is what looks like, you know, positions, important positions in the two major political parties are available only to the highest bidders. So the uh, point is about how the political process has been monetized and how that is not going to change. If as a political uh, aspirant, you pay as much as 50 million naira to become governor, uh, or to even get a leg into the, into the primaries, and you pay 100 million to uh, get a, a foot you know, into the uh, door uh, to become a presidential aspirant, okay, that's not the only cost that you will incur. You know, you still have to print posters, you have to mobilize delegates, you have to... Yes, the electoral act is, there is a ceiling on that election finance campaign. But even the INEC is not in a position to monitor that effectively. So what it means is that if you don't have money, you cannot aspire to lead a Nigerian or Nigerians, whether you are in the APC or you are in the People's Democratic Party. This same yesterday, the nomination forms in the People's Democratic Party 
you know, closed. At the end of the day, the PDP was able to raise 646 million, 640 million from 16 male presidential aspirants, 6 million from the only female uh, presidential aspirant, making a total of 646 million. But it looks like the APC is going to make more money. And the big allegation against the APC is that it is curious that the same APC that is fighting against corruption is going to promote corruption. Because if you make people pay as much as 100 million, uh, 100 million, uh, 20 million, you know, uh, 25 million, to be able to just get expression of interest forms and nomination forms, then of course you are saying uh, that some of them can even borrow, except in the case of Ashwaju Bola Ahmed Tinumbu, uh, on whose behalf the Director General of the Tinumbu uh, Support Organization. One Honorable Suleiman, who says he's a businessman from Kirby State, has issued a check of 100 million. Well, who is going to investigate all these people donating money to say, we are buying nomination forms on your behalf as individuals? Do they pay tax? This 100 million, 50 million, whatever million, where is it coming from? What do these people do for a living? I'm not sure that there is an oversight process uh, in place, and that is what makes it unfortunate. However, for youths below the ages of uh, 40, 35 and below, the APC in its own case has said, well, you may not pay, you are, you, you are given a rebate of, uh, 30, of uh, 50 percent on expression of interest. But how much is that? You still have to go and look for money. And for women and, uh, you know, um, uh, disabled persons, persons with uh, physical disability, you also have to, uh, you know, they've given them a rebate on, uh, on uh, nomination forms, okay? You, you know, they removed one of the distance, but still, it's still a lot of money, okay? However, more important things said at that meeting uh, of the 11th uh, National Executive uh, uh, Meeting of, the, uh, of uh, APC yesterday. One, President Buhari was advising the party not to behave the way the PDP behaved in 2015 and to ensure unity and to ensure that they are focused, right? He gave that advice. I think it's, a, it's very useful advice, you know, uh, for the party to be focused, to learn from the experience of PDP. The PDP must be laughing. Two, the uh, chairman of the party uh, is saying that, look, governors should respect party structures and that they cannot have two structures in the states, and that the big problem that the APC has is the ego of former governors, and the conflict between former governors and serving governors, and the conflict between serving governors and party chairman. I hope that all of those messages, uh, someone uh, will listen to that, you know, and uh, he made a point about Section 8412. I don't agree with him. He says the matter is subjudice. Well, maybe he's right in that regard, but I think that the more appropriate thing uh, that, uh, you know, Chairman Abdullahi Adamu should have said is that people should be cautious. So both parties need to be cautious going forward, and we look forward to the conventions. APC will start sale of forms on April 22. I, uh, PDP has already issued its own timetable, and uh, you know these conventions will be held between the end of May and uh, June 1, and by June 5 they will make returns to INEC. So the race effectively has started, and we are all stakeholders in that process. That's all the news here. We'll take a short break. When we return, we'll have Rotus, Michael, Adefemi, Aaron, and everybody to give us updates on Africa's global business support and activities across the globe. Stay with us. All right, moving on to a business update. Michael Wilson now joins us from London. Michael, great to have you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, let's turn our attention to Asia Pacific, first of all. And as usual, stocks fairly uh mix there investors still wondering what kind of support the chinese government is going to give to the economy as we know it's grappling with that covid wave as we know shanghai is locked down and so on uh, the the only the bright the brightness really coming from japan where the yen is trading um slightly uh, slightly up a kind of trading range that seems to suggest it's getting slightly stronger here's a conundrum for you if you were an investor looking at government bonds 
you'd now be looking at Chinese uh, U.S. Treasuries over China bonds. Um, the, the Treasuries have actually the yields has actually the yields actually overtaken um, Chinese bonds, government bonds uh, at the moment, um, and and we're seeing investors actually moving out of Chinese government bonds. I'm looking at 18 billion dollars ditched uh, over the past month, which is a, which is a record um, for that. It's not entirely clear as to whether that says a great deal about the Chinese economy right now, but it's certainly a kind of forward indication. Let's turn our attention to the United States. And just before we hit the market, um, they, they, uh, the, the US has imposed a fresh round of sanctions against Bitcoin miners and other banks um, in, uh, in, in Russia. Uh, the Trans Capital Bank, uh, that's number one, a network of more than 40 people, including the oligarch Konstantin uh, Malola, Malafeyev. Um, again, he, he's a he's a well-known uh, oligarch figure um, in Russia, and the Biden administration is still actually crushing down on those kind of things. What effect it's actually having, do not know at the moment. Stock futures um, slightly up, futures on the Dow um, up a little yesterday. They're like Tesla yesterday. I'll have a little bit more about that. United Airlines. Um, and other stocks which are in the middle of the reporting season. Um, Tesla up about 5%, as I say, more about that in a second. The Dow rose about 280 points yesterday. Uh, Netflix shares, again, we talked about this yesterday, biggest decline uh, in, in the company's um, history over increased competition. So let's turn our attention to Tesla um, at 16.76 billion in revenue, record margins in quarter one, um, deliveries holding up as far as one can tell. That's really the only indication that we have from Tesla, um, apart from the actual money itself. But if you look at deliveries, that's quite important. But they are saying that they've lost a certain amount of what they call build volume, um, given the shutdown in Shanghai, which is taking place as we speak. And Elon Musk, Elon Musk actually himself, saying he thinks that inflation is higher than the official numbers actually say, unsurprising about that, but also thinks it's going to stay higher for longer than the US authorities actually say it will. Turn our attention to Amazon, which is opening up a prime delivery service. Now, what it's doing here, reported the other day about it charging merchants now to use its warehouses, its delivery services. OK, there is that. But what it's also now doing is it's inviting certain of its major merchants to join with them on a sort of prime Amazon prime um, co-option of these companies onto Amazon's delivery and ordering. The, the actual terms of that are unclear at the moment, but that's certainly, it certainly wants to take on FedEx and, and, and the other delivery companies there. A warning from the World Bank. Now, the, meet, the IMF and the World Bank are meeting in Washington um, over the next couple of days, and the, um, the, the World Bank has warned of a human food catastrophe because of Ukraine. Food prices rising up some 30 37 percent, according to the World Bank and, and the IMF. Um, and of course, this hits the poor much more than the rich, just as, as COVID did. And the World Bank's actually noting that it might want to think about how it's going to use some of its resources to help the world's poor as they struggle out of this food catastrophe. Um, the EU and Shanghai lockdown is affecting EU companies in terms of they're describing it as a logistical nightmare. Um, again, no no indication as to when that lockdown is going to be lifted uh, in China. As far as the UK energy crisis is concerned, a cold winter facing a lot of people, more people forced into fuel um, fuel, what they call fuel poverty. Uh, energy bosses now saying that they need some kind of help. Very, very difficult to understand exactly what a government would do because somebody at the end of the line has got to pay all the bills. And as you know, as most um, in d developed countries, governments are particularly stretched first by the pandemic and now this. We'll be watching very closely today out of Washington what the, the various central bankers, Jay Powell, Christine Lagarde and Andrew Bailey, are saying about um, 
their, about inflation, about interest rates and what they feel about the world in general. Um, that'll be a, a watch today, be report, reporting no doubt on that tomorrow. Oil markets surprisingly quiet and gold is fairly steady. That is the global view this morning. All right. Thanks so much, Michael. Uh, real quickly, for the first time, I think I'll support Elon on this. Uh, a lot of people are saying maybe the Fed is masking what is really happening in the American economy. Real estate costs, gasoline prices, the CPI of America as we speak is in tatters. And it looks as though the Fed isn't doing anything about it. It looks as though the Fed is too small and those inflation numbers keep creeping up. Their argument is, oh, we're hitting peak inflation soon. They are doing the year-on-year -year analysis. But when you look at the monthly inflation jump, it's astronomical. So I support Elon Musk on this. I mean, I don't know what you, what you like to say. Secondly, I want to ask, is the, will the loans from COVID cause any big problems? And I ask this because of what happened in the French debate yesterday, the French presidential debates. Marie Le Pen kept on happening on the 600 billion collected by France in loans to be able to fight COVID and the likes. And I remember that just across uh, the channel of uh, Calais and Dover, Britain collected three up to 400 billion too. Could that be something that is having a knock-on effect on the inflation we're seeing? Because Marie Le Pen kept on happening on it. And Emmanuel Macron kept on saying, yeah, you know, we used to pay for low schemes and things like that and all of that. But now we are in dire straits economically. Yeah, I, I think that uh, uh, what, what the, 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 the knock on effects of the pandemic, whether it be savings or expenditure, still actually nobody's drawn a red line under that at the moment. I still think we're, we're waiting to see. I fully understand what, what you're saying, and it could have that, that kind of effect. I think as far as France is concerned, Marie Le Pen has, has quite naturally latched on to, she's trying to move attention um, away from her supposed cozying up to Putin though, all those months ago. Uh, what she's doing is now she's, she's going on this cost of living thing. No surprising that she went to rural areas um, over the past week. Uh, particularly Burgundy and going to talk to farmers who are worried about the rising cost of fertilizer and of course the rising cost of living um, how, how, how what the, the so-called savings of, of the pandemic will actually come up against the spending again I think that's that's something which we will see um, in, in in the autumn budget in the UK I think it's too early but I think you're absolutely right I mean we should be we should certainly be be focusing on that as far as the Fed's concerned I mean yes Elon Elon Musk may well be right. I mean, I'm sure that many people who live not on Wall Street, but in Main Street in the United States are finding expenditure actually rising very high. Depends where you spend your money, doesn't it? I mean, if you're, if you're spending it on driving, you're going to be hit by the rise in fuel, if it, fuel, uh, fuel at the pumps. If you're not driving, but you're going to the supermarket and buying food for your, your expanding family, then you will be noticing that. The one thing that the desperately unpleasant thing about all this is that we know that it hits those people who are the poorest most because they tend to be spending on on you know things which are forced purchases like food well, and God. like fuel and and, 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 and the debate then the debate now is whether it's heating or eating really Michael, I wanted to ask you about David Marpas who granted an interview to BBC he was talking about food security and also in Washington yesterday, the major issue is about food security and what India can do uh, to help. But the major issue raised by David Marpas is about debt, the rising debt burden of uh, developing countries. Do you think that we'll get to a point in this regard, everybody is blaming the Ukrainian war, where developing countries, that are developed countries that are dangerously quiet in, on this matter, uh, would... Uh, do debt forgiveness, debt cancellation, so that poorer countries of the world can be better uh, protected. And if that is uh, the case, if it happens, if it would, uh, where would China stand in the matter? Because China has, you know, uh, so much exposure also to these poorer and developing countries. That's one. Two, Germany is talking from both sides of the mouth. One week after Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, talked about blood money. The finance minister says, well, you know, we will, stop buying, uh, we will, we will not stop buying German energy for now. Uh, we will do it gradually. Uh, but another minister, 
Uh, he's saying the foreign affairs minister is saying something else. The opposition is saying something else. Uh, is uh, Germany playing games? Because Germany is saying, look, we will do it, we will not do it. So it's just, it, it's just political rhetoric, considering the fact that Germany, Austria, Italy, and some of those other countries in the EU generally are vulnerable in the face of the energy crisis that the world faces from Ukraine and also from Russia. We were talking yesterday about Germany, weren't we, and about the, 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 the fact that they're finding it very difficult to reverse the decision that was taken in 2011 after the, after the Japanese nuclear disaster at Fukuyama, um, and, and, and to whether they're actually going to reverse their idea about having nuclear power, because like it or not, that really is the, the only solution. The problem with Germany... Uh, is, yes, you're absolutely right. They are speaking out of both sides of their mouth. And the reason that that's happening there is, of course, because of the coalition. I mean, the Greens are part of the, the ruling coalition and the Greens are not suddenly going to row back on their on, on, on their nuclear position. I was reading this morning, um, just before we came on air, that, uh, you know, Germany is now saying we will not, we will not stop using um, Russian oil and gas imports by... I don't know what it was, 2025, 2030, whenever it may be, or even by the end of the year. So, and, and yet, a few days ago, Schultz was saying, wasn't he, that, you know, this, this is possibly something that they need to work out. So they do actually need to find, A, a single voice, and it's very difficult for them to do this. I'm not I'm not blaming them, I'm not siding with them, I'm just saying I can see how it is very difficult when you have um, a, a, ruling, a ruling coalition of so many, so many different interests. I think what David Malpass was saying yesterday, um, I mean, look, it's not, it doesn't take a genius, does it, to understand. You're right. I think that, you know, it's convenient to have these scapegoats. It's either Ukraine or it's the, it's the COVID pandemic. You know, the fact of the matter is that a lot of the World Bank and, and the IMF loans, which, are, which were put out to countries um, were on terms which were agreed, or at least the, 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 the process of doing it was agreed, you know, after the Second World War. I mean, these are different times now. And, and you're absolutely right to, to focus on China. What will the push and pull be on that? Will they be saying, uh, do they worry about their exposure? Or should the countries who've taken the loans worry about their exposure to those loans? I think that's that's where that, that debate needs to happen. I think you're absolutely correct to, to focus on those two areas. I, I, I honestly don't think anybody knows knows what the answers are at the moment. If, if I were the IMF, given the Greek experience, which we observed 10 years ago, I'd be going slightly less hard on some of those countries and, and watch them navigate their way out of their difficulties. Again, we were talking about Sri Lanka. There's a prime example. Why doesn't the IMF do something constructive there instead of just calling the debt in when it, when it wishes to? That's what we need. We need some kind of understanding and, uncertain, and leadership from these kind of organisations which are set up. And I personally believe they have very little touch with the real world, but I, I may be alone in that. All right, thank, thank you so you much, much, Michael. It's time for a short break on the morning show. Welcome back to the morning show. Here on the Rise News, our dependable road to Sudiri is here to give you an African business update. Morning, Good morning, everybody. Yeah, we begin with the OECD, Organization of Economic uh, Cooperation and Development. Nigeria, Kenya, Sri Lanka, and I think Pakistan have opted out of the global um, tax deal, the 15% uh, threshold, mm -hmm. which they were supposed to put together to, in order to stop um, multinational enterprises from moving uh, money around, basically. I think it's called BEPS. Um, uh, or perhaps it's just basic erosion of profit, basic baseline erosion of profit shifting, where you move your you know money um, income from a higher tax jurisdiction to a lower one. And as you can see here, even this chart, I think it was back from October, Nigeria, Kenya, Sri Lanka, they've been opposed to it. One of the reasons why uh, for Nigeria is because they say there's a lack of transparency and also a lack of data as to whether or not um, what is being implemented will actually assist developing nations in being able to capture as many as much tax receipts as they can from these multinational um, enterprises. Interestingly enough, Nigeria didn't provide any counter data to show whether or not their own um, practices would bring in um, more 
more tax revenues for them. But then the argument, though, is that it's, your, it's the OECD that's putting this forward. So you're there, the ones, the onus is on them to put the data forward to show Nigeria that that's the case. But so, I, you know, it looks like as of right now with Kenya, Nigeria, Pakistan, um, Sri Lanka, that they're, uh, they're going to be they're going to be opting out of this. Uh, we move to the reserves. Um, the U.S. dollar reserves have inched up uh, in uh, April, I think about 283 243 million dollars is uh, is what we saw a slight accretion in reserves. You take a look at the um, the figures here. I think in uh, what was it April the f yeah there it is April first so 39.54 billion as of April 19th um, 39.78. Back in March they fell by about 343 million from 39.86 to 39.55. Net net, it's probably still less, but again, um, as far as the reasons why the reserves are not um, increasing, we, we know the issues. Um, I think there's a quote here from Gordon Mefele from the last monetary policy committee um, uh, gathering where he said the moderate accretion to reserves reflects the duality of Nigeria's position as an oil exporter and an importer of refined petroleum products. So basically, with whatever it is you export, you're spending so much on FX bringing um, those um, refined products back in, which is why, of course, there is this uh, hope that the Dangote refinery will save Nigeria as uh, uh, costs on what we're spending on foreign exchange. Uh, we move to aviation and the Bureau of Statistics, a data dump, I like doing data dumps. The B Bureau of Statistics has released um, st data on passenger traffic um, and basically air traffic rebounded in 2021. So I think we'll start with um, domestic um, travelers uh, where we see that we had 13 million domestic travelers um, total uh, through the airport, passengers that passed through airports. 43% increase from where we were in 2020. Arrivals, 6.5 million of them, 34% increase. Domestic departure, 54% uh, increase, about 6.4 million. Um, international, lower, which, you know, makes sense. I mean, it's going to be domestic travelers that will be carrying uh, the bulk of these passenger passenger traffic. International passengers, 2.2 million, 57% increase uh, from 2020. As far as arrivals, 1.1, similar figures, but 60% higher arrivals, 54% more uh, departures as far as the flow um, is concerned. Uh, I think top airport, airports with the most domestic traffic, according to the Bureau of Statistics, Namdi Azikiwe in the Federal Capital Territory had 2.75 uh, million domestic um, passengers total. Uh, Murtala Mohammed was second, uh, you know, 2.09 million, and then Port Harcourt, 900,000 um, passengers that flowed through. On the international side, they flipped. Um, Murtala Mohammed had, uh, what was the figure, 1.5 million. Uh, you can see the big gap there, Namdi Azikiwe, 565. Potako doesn't even, you know, even bother mentioning them. Um, and then to, uh, what's next? Uh, Angola, I believe uh, this is uh, Luigi uh, De Mao. De Mao. He is the um, foreign affairs minister for, um, for, for Italy. Italy is now uh, eyeing Angola next. They've already signed, we talked about Algeria. Apparently they also signed a deal with, um, with Egypt. So they are really serious about um, diversifying away from, um, from Russia, as far as Russia is I think we take a look at the summary here. They basically signed a deal with um, Egypt. They've signed a deal with Algeria. They have, now he's planning to head over to and apparently Mario Draghi caught COVID, so he can't travel for now. So um, Luigi is going to be going to uh, Angola, and then apparently next up is the Republic of Congo, and then the, this Mozambique isn't quite finalized yet, um, but they are they are looking at them. And I'm sorry I had to do this, but Mario Luigi, um, there is actually oh, <laughs> no seriously there is a, there is actually and this is anecdotal that Nintendo Super Mario video game, which sold about 40 million copies, actually increased tourism to Italy in the 80s. Now, you have to go yeah. back to when the game was released Not and look at... I'm sure it did. Yeah, because it the Mario is... So, you know, of course, Super Draghi Mario. is called Super Mario. Yeah. His foreign affairs minister is Luigi. So, yeah, sorry, I, I had to do that. I have been able to resist it myself. I know, I, I couldn't help you. <laughs> the moment I, I want to so, talk about yeah. the OECD, and yes. I'm actually... I, I fail to see why Nigeria would ever even present figures. Why should they? Mm. I remember mentioning this on your segment, Rotis. I can't remember when it was last year. I don't remember in reference to what. It's all mm. a blur. Yeah. But, I'm 
I'm sorry. You cannot just hear, oh, multinationals should stop rerouting their profits to low tax jurisdictions. Sign here, mm. and you just sign. 136 countries signed, Nigeria did not, and I'm proud of the fact that we did not. And you have to use your brain and figure out what works for your country. Yeah. Because according to their figures, 70 to 80 percent of the money that accrues yeah. is going to go to the develop developed world, not to us in the developing world. It doesn't right, even yeah. benefit us in any way. Their whole premise or their projections made no sense to us. It has to make sense to us, mm. and we have to have independent thinking. So Very I true. completely yes, support that. Yes, talk about the yeah. industry. Yeah. Because I think it's important that you brought it up. I think the uh, increase in air travel, as indicated in the air transport report by the Bureau of Statistics, is understandable. 44% increase between 2020 and 2021, yeah. December. Now, 2020, peak of... Uh, COVID. You know, COVID-19, yeah. and then you have all those closures and all that. So it was foreseeable mm. that in 2021, there will be that sharp increase, both in domestic travel and international travels. And the airports identified, these are the major, you know, hubs for Nigeria. Uh, Motala Mohamed Airport, Namdi Azikiwe, and, the, uh, you know, the international airport in Port Harcourt. However, I think going beyond the just uh, statistics, the thing to worry about is that beyond 2021, the aviation industry in Nigeria remains troubled, terribly troubled. By March, the airlines operators, the airline operators of Nigeria, AON, they were complaining about issues with Forex. They were complaining about access to jet fuel. Yep. They were threatening to even shut down. Now, by end of March, there was a sharp increase in uh, airfares. Yeah. The danger in that is that domestic travel going forward is likely to suffer. Many Nigerians these days, you know, cannot travel because of the high cost in, of uh, airfares. Right. Beyond the high cost of airfares, it's also the very poor service that is offered. We have had situations whereby passengers fight at airports, whether it is uh, Max Air or with any other uh, particular airline. And you also have uh, even the international airlines at a point threatening to start charging in dollars. But as a result of the outrage that that attracted, Very they have to back now. I saw Italy. Italy takes 40% of its uh, energy from uh, Russia. Right. And what the Italian authorities have been doing, and others too, including Spain, is to look elsewhere. So they've gone to Algeria they've, uh, to get more, about 9 uh, million cubic uh, feet of uh, gas. Mm. And now they're going, they've gone to uh, Egypt through ENI, you know, the uh, Italian uh, petroleum company. Now they are going to Angola, mm. from Angola to Congo, to Mozambique. Uh, the curious thing is that nobody is coming to Nigeria yeah. because Nigeria does not have the infrastructure. Yeah, These other African countries that we have mentioned are going to benefit. Nigeria is out of it because we do not have enough people who can engage in future-looking, forward-looking, rigorous thinking to think of advantages, you know, uh, for, the, for the country. However, you know, maybe the uh, crisis in the world it was unforeseeable, mm -hmm. but countries are prepared. And it is the countries that are prepared that will take advantage of whatever you know, fallouts you have, even within the global space. So I, I think they are talking to Nigeria already. Yeah, really. There was a delegation, there was the a delegation that came from the EU yeah. to talk to Nigeria. But that was just a talk. It was a talk, but I think now it's time to make that talk action, because you can actually make a lot of free revenue from here. We can make clear year on year about $40 billion more yeah. If we harness our resource and really churn our gas and make all our gas infrastructure work mm -hmm. rather than flaring this gas because Nigeria is literally wasting this gas that other nations need. Yeah. Concerning OECD and taxes, we have to be genuine ourselves. Yes, Nigeria shouldn't sign up to it. But my big question is, where's your empirical data? Because you see, this is the way the analogy works. It's been proven everywhere in the world that when you reduce income, uh, business taxation, more companies come, come to that the, area right. and you get more money. Right. Look at Verve in Switzerland. Look at even Ireland right. as a country. Ireland year on year grew over 14, 
15%, they're about, you know, double-digit growth because of most of the money from taxation. And that's why you see that companies like Apple, Google, and the like okay. all have offices at their hub in Ireland. In fact, Twitter pays more in taxes to the Irish government than the British government. And that's why Britain, too, is even trying to reduce taxes and the like. So I think Nigeria should also look at this empirically and work on it. And considering uh, uh, Mario... Yeah. And Luigi. So, so there's, there's actually a funny story. Yeah. The Nintendo guys were actually working out of their first office in America. And I think it was the name of the landlord or one of the handymen that was coming to work. It was a plumber. Mario is a plumber. The plumber. Right, 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 right. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. And, and they just said, oh, who, who are we going to name the character? Then they named Mario, Mario just and like that. Boom, and it stopped. There you go. Boom. <laughs> that was the story behind it. <laughs>